Hi, um, hi Sergio. Hi, Bill. Hi, Omis. How are you? Hello. Good. Good. Good to see you. So, did Costia join? Um, Let me just check if he maybe could not. Uh, let me just make sure he's not uh, in the. Oh, yeah, he's asking for the password. Does he need a password? Uh, he shouldn't need one. I think he should be. Do you know which uh, email he's using to try to access this? Uh, um, he should not need a password. So. Um. Make sure. Sergio, do you see a email from him or is he? Well, I, he was just pinging me two minutes ago asking for the password, and I replied that he probably doesn't need a password. Uh, yeah, so he shouldn't need he's one. probably checking. I asked him to check his email. He's probably checking his email. I also sent him the link that I use, but I don't know if, the, if my link is. No, no, it should, it should work. I think it should work. So, so let's, let's uh, I'll check in the meantime. To... Maybe he doesn't have a Zoom account. We don't use Zoom that much. <laughs> so it could be that. Oh, there he is. Okay, he's joined. Looks like. Uh, Costia, are you? Um, so, Costia, if you want, can you unmute and? So apparently he had to create a Zoom account, but he joined in. He's having trouble with the microphone. Okay, okay, good. We're getting closer. I think, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we're getting closer. Maybe you can start if you want, up to you, but- No, no, it's okay, let's take a minute. Hopefully he's fair the problem. Yeah, <laughs> <In the> meantime, <laughs> that's good. We just don't use, you know, Zoom that much normally. Yeah.
Hello? Oh, hi, Christian. I apologize. Uh, I did not have an account, and apparently there is a lot to go through before it starts working. <laughs> okay, good. Well, glad you made it. Okay, great. So, so shall we get started? Um, okay, so well, welcome everyone. Uh, so today is the last uh, colloquium for the for this uh, for this for the spring until until the fall, and um, we have a very fitting colloquium today. It's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Sergio and Kostya here from Google, um, and uh, to tell us about the not just the latest their latest experiment. Uh, I think it's a seventy qubit quantum you know random circuit sampling quantum supremacy experiment but also uh, to tell us about uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the theory work that has gone on behind it. So um, you all, um, you know, uh, Sergio has spoken in this colloquium before. He, he heads the, the quantum group at Google and he, he did a lot of the, uh, the theory work behind the original experiment and this experiment and Kostya, uh, is in the group. He he does condensed matter theory, and he's been involved in both this experiment and the time crystals experiment and so on. So so really looking forward to your talk today, and uh, and the panel afterwards. So, uh, Sergio. Great, thank you very much, Omes, for the introduction. Oops, um, uh, Sergio, I can't, I think you're muted. Okay, uh, now you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, let me see what happens when I share my slides, maybe. Uh, I think you're muted again. Okay, that's a bit weird. As soon as I share my screen, it mutes me. Uh, some, maybe we can unmute you after you after you share. Should we try that? Did it work? Can you hear me? Yeah, works. Yeah. Okay, great. I don't know why when I share the screen, it mutes me. Perfect. So you can hopefully see the slides as well. Uh, no, now he can't see the slide. I can't see the slide. Oh, really? <laughs> he says you're, says, I'm sorry, in the screen. Uh -huh. um, okay. Sorry, my slide's not showing anymore. You didn't see my slides anywhere. No. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I'm doing a screen share. If I go to this word before, could you please oh, try okay. seeing them again? Okay, I'll try again. And you know what? I'm gonna try. I was seeing a tab. Let me just do this again. Maybe this will work more right there and showing a whole window. Is it working now? Yes, can see. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Okay. Great. So, okay, a bit eventful. Uh, yeah, so thank you, I was saying, thank you very much, Umes, for the uh, invitation to talk here. And uh, yes, indeed, I'm going to talk about phase transitions in random circuit sampling and random circuit sampling in general. So this is um, with, with Kostya. Uh, let me see if I can move the slides, perfect. And yeah, you can see the laser, great. So let me give you a little bit of an outline of the main things we're going to talk about. So um, as Uma said, we just we, we did recently a new random circuit sampling experiment. And one of the reasons why we do random circuit sampling is because it's a benchmark of the system fidelity. So the fidelity of uh, the whole circuits, the whole system uh, in experimental quantum processors. And it's very important for us to measure fidelity if we keep improving the system, but not just fidelity of gates, but the fidelity of the whole system. So it's a benchmark of fidelity. And as a benchmark of fidelity, we repeated this same experiment that we did in 2023, but this time with 70 qubits instead of 53 and 60% more gates. Uh, so we did 700 
two two qubit gates compared to 430, I think it was in 2017. But because we have improved the fidelity of the different components, uh, now we obtain, you know, for a circuit with more qubits and more gate, the same fidelity is in total fidelity as in 2019. So that's good for us as of using random circuit sampling as a benchmark of system fidelity. But random circuit sampling is also a computational benchmark, meaning a benchmark uh, where you can compare the computational cost of this particular computational task, so sampling the output of a noisy random circuit against all known algorithms in a supercomputer, let's say. I think this remains actually the only interesting computational benchmark where you can compete against a supercomputer for experimental quantum processors. So uh, that's what we did in 2019, but then uh, classical algorithms have improved a lot in the meantime. They were actually able to um, reproduce the sampling that we did in 2019 already. Uh, so now with more qubits and more gates, uh, we have also been uh, studying all the classical algorithms and the improvement in classical algorithms. We improve them a little bit ourselves and we come with the following uh, slightly optimistic estimate. If you were to try to do the sampling that we just did now on Frontier, which is now the largest supercomputer with all the improvements of algorithms that we know about, uh, it comes out to 50 years. Um, so uh, I guess the quantum computers remain ahead. And finally, as Ume said, we're also gonna talk about, well, Kosti is gonna talk about some of the theory that um, we've been doing in the meantime. And this is um, this is aimed to answer the following question. Is there some noise limit up to which we can actually claim that we're um, using the full size of Hilbert space so that you know entanglement remains useful in random circuit sampling up to some given noise limit. Um, so the answer to that is yes. And there is a phase transition actually within the weak noise regime where we can um, explore the full uh, Hilbert space and the strong noise regime where it does not true anymore. The, the uh, wave function kind of breaks apart into a correlated components. Uh, so that's a phase transition, as Costi will explain. Uh, we actually can observe this phase transition experimentally. So it's a noise induced, induced phase transition that we observe experimentally. Um, of course, you know, the experiment itself with 70 qubits in the weak noise phase, that's important. And, and it's also important among other things, well, not only because in the strong noise regime, you cannot, you know, try to do cross entropy benchmarking uh, 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 and, and random circuit sampling. Uh, uh, you know, several things break down, but among others, uh, this is also related to spoofing. So there have been multiple very interesting spoofing algorithms um, proposed lately. And to be protected against spoofing algorithms, you need to be at least on the weak noise regime. So that's gonna be the, the main ideas that we're gonna talk about. Uh, before we get to random circuit sampling itself, let me um, give you a sort of a bigger context. So what is the roadmap for Google in, in quantum computing? So um, in, in 2019, we did the first version of random circuit sampling, the experiment we're gonna talk about today, uh, an improved version. Um, we just announced a few months ago, um, so most of our roadmap is about building a fault uh, error corrected quantum computer. So most of our roadmap is about error correction, quantum error correction using the surface code. So we just announced a couple of months ago what we call the log logical qubit prototype. And that means that for the first time, we were able to increase the distance of the surface code for distance three to distance five and observe that the logical error actually goes down instead of going up because probably more qubits, they have more noise, but they have low and component errors that um, the logical error went down from distance three to distance five. So this is it's a prototype. Um, um, we will see the errors are still too high to, to scale it, but the point is, well, we want to decrease the errors and then eventually increase the number of qubits so that we have um, as the next milestone, what we call milestone three, what we call a long leaf logical qubit. So this will be a logical qubit with a coherence time that can be measured in seconds or minutes instead of microseconds with error correction. And we expect to be able to do that around, uh, well, 2025 plus, so maybe next year, 2026. And anyway, there are more milestones in a roadmap until eventually, um, um, perhaps by the end of the decade, we actually have an error corrected quantum computer, so probably a, pro, uh, a quantum computer, um, not just an experimental processor, meaning you can program it and it won't have errors and it will run for a long time. And for that, we need around a million physical qubits and uh, much lower physical errors, component errors that we have now. So um, the way we measure the progression in, in this roadmap or 
the main thing we're working on now, let's say, is reducing the component errors, reducing the physical errors. That's actually more important right now that scaling the number of qubits. And the reason is that, well, in, in the plot in the right, you see in the x-axis the code distance in the surface code, and the y-axis the logical error per cycle. And the gray line here, this is the experiment that we just announced. And what we want to see is that um, as you increase the code distance, the error goes down. And we measure that with a parameter that we call lambda, which is the ratio between distance three divided by, by um, sorry, distance five, distance three divided by distance five. So you want the error to go down. You want lambda to be more than one. And it went down, but only by like 4%, which is not enough to scale. So we want to, for instance, um, uh, in the near term, get to lambda two, which means reducing the device performance, the component errors by around a factor of two. And if we manage to do that, then we get a lambda of two where the error, the, the logical error goes down as we increase the distance from three to five. And eventually for mass plus three, we will need to run a, a lambda of four. So the errors, the logical error goes down by a factor of four as we increase the code distance in other steps. So that around distance um, 15 or 17, which is um, roughly you know, between 500 and 1,000 physical qubits, we actually have a long leaf, uh, a long leaf um, logical qubit. So this will be like the mass than three regime. This is where we wanna go. So we're focusing on lowering um, physical errors, improving device performance. So that means increasing lambda and, and then scaling kind of at the same time. Great. So now let me uh, turn back to the main topic of the talk today, which is um, random quantum circuit sampling. Okay, so what we do in random quantum circuit sampling is we have some experimental quantum processor in a 2D architecture. So this is um, what the architecture looks like with just 18 qubits. We're gonna be running the experiment that we're gonna present today with uh, 70 qubits, uh, but this is still 2D. And then we um, run a, a quantum circuit that we choose a random. So we choose the single qubit gates random. And then after the single qubit gates, we do layers of two qubit gates. The two qubit gates are iSwap like. So they are kind of uh, an iSwap with some extra phase, uh, an extra control C phase. The reason why we use this iSwap likes two qubit gates is because we want to maximize the spread of entanglement. So iSwaps um, or you know, is also related to computational cost or um, try to protect against the spoofing, things like that, or reaching a uh, regime at which cross entropy works. So this is kind of an optimized gate. Um, in a nutshell, it spreads entanglement faster than let's say a control C on a two qubit high random gate. So that's what we use that. And also we optimize the single qubit gates a little bit. So if we use a discrete gate of single qubit gates, they are Hadamard-like, so they are pi over two rotations on the xy plane. And um, well, th this is the discrete gate set. If we choose um, the axis according to these values of p, so this will be the axis uh, x, y, minus x, minus y. They are Clifford gates uh, and an isop is also Clifford. But then we add these other gates, which are 45 axes in between on the x-way plane uh, to have non Clifford gates, which is very important for the computational cost claim. So anyway, this is the, the random gates are just choosing random single qubit gates from this set. And um, again, this set of gates is optimized to spread entanglement as fast as possible. Um, there is also a, a um, technical point, which is when we, to use the discrete, the discrete error set, we need to do what is called phase matching. Um, so what that means is uh, when we implement physically this iSwap light gates, so the two qubit gates, uh, we get an extra phase, an extra C rotation on the qubits. So if we do not compensate for that extra gate rotation, so we don't control it, we don't compensate it, we just declare that to be part of the circuit, then we get extra phases, so then uh, the gate set is actually continuous with some, there are still pi half rotations on the XY plane, but with an axis which is random, not just discrete. Uh, so there is less control in this case. Uh, if we remove these extra phases that we get when we implement the two qubit gates, then we do the phase match discrete gate set. So this is kind of a technicality, but it's harder to do the experiment on the non-phase, on the phase match case 
which we did uh, actually this year. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, in a nutshell, we implement a random circuit with single qubit gates, uh, chosen at random from this gate set and two qubit gates to be eye swaps to spread entanglement. But then in an experiment, we actually have noise. So we need some model, model of what the noise, um, what the sampling looks like when you have noise. So here is a very simple model that works well often. So the, this very simple model says that because you have noise, you're gonna actually sample from a mixture of the ideal probabilities. So these are the ideal probabilities according to the ideal random circuit of a bit of string S. But because you have noise, you sample from a mixture of the ideal probabilities with the uniform distribution where all beta strings have the same probability. So noise makes the system, the probabilities of the outcome more uniform. And the intuition behind that is, well, if you don't have noise, then you have um, coherent interference of quantum, you know, Feynman paths if you want on the random circuit. So this coherent interference gives you speckles like in a laser, it gives you probabilities which have uh, output stream probabilities which are higher than others. So in these speckles of a laser, you have red points and dark points. But if you add noise, if you don't have a fully coherent evolution, then you tend to get this more like diffusive light, which is not coherent, and then this more uniform light. So that's an intuition. Um, you can actually argue this more physically, why this model often worked well or, or more formally like in this paper. And in this mixture between the ideal probabilities and the uniform distribution, there is this very important parameter, which is the fidelity, which you can understand as the probability of having no error. So with when you have no errors, you're sampling from the ideal probability. So with fidelity F, you sample from the ideal probability. When you have one or more errors with fidelity one minus f, you sample from the uniform distribution. Now, this is only a simplified model. This is another technicality. Um, but in the experiment, uh, this model doesn't really apply. Uh, so we can, you know, we have a, another model which is a bit more complex, but all the um, everything we do also works under this model. And the main point is that whatever the noise does, well, the ideal probabilities are still quite anti, they're anti-concentrated. They're bright spots of beta strings with high probability, but it's pretty flat is distribution is called anti-concentration. So the noise does not concentrate the output. That's one property that you want of the noise, which makes sense. Noise does, doesn't tend to concentrate in uh, a few beta strings. And more importantly, the um, noise, whatever the noise does to the probabilities of your beta strings is something it's uncorrelated with the ideal probability of the beta string. This is sort of the key property. And if you have these properties, then for most of what we do, like uh, that I will explain on the simplify model, um, you actually can make it work on this more realistic model. So it's a technicality, but uh, just to keep it in mind. Okay, so now that we have a model for what we're actually doing experimentally, so we sampler, sample uh, beta strings from this, um, noisy uh, distribution, what do we actually do with the beta strings? Well, we, most of what we do is called cross-entropy benchmarking. And what that means is we sample, let's say a million beta strings, and then we define a function of the ideal probability. So for the beta strings that we obtain in an experimental sample, we calculate what is the ideal probabilities of those beta strings. And then we define some function of those ideal probabilities, which is kind of an order one function. Uh, so here is an example. We calculate the ideal probabilities. We multiply by the two to the number of qubits. So this number then is order one instead of one or two to the n. And um, um, we average uh, these numbers over the sample bit strings and we normalize with a minus one. Another example is, again, we calculate the ideal probabilities. We normalize them, but now we take the log and we do like a different normalization. So these functions here of the um, ideal probabilities of the beta strings that we sample is what we call cross entropy benchmarking. Um, we do other statistical tests as well, like Kolmorov of Smirnov that you can look up in the papers. So why do we actually define these particular functions with um, these particular offsets? Well, the reason is that for large enough depths, so when the output becomes um, anti-concentrated or it approaches the what we expect of a random quantum state, which is this uh, Porter-Thomas distribution, where the distribution of the beta strings is exponential. So 
for the depth at least logarithmic or more. Um, it turns out that these particular functions with these particular offsets, the linear cosentropy of the logarithmic cosentropy, are an estimator of the fidelity. And the fidelity, remember, is this parameter that we introduce uh, as a parameter in the mixture of the noisy sampling, which corresponds roughly to the probability of not having an error in the circuit. So that's why uh, this random circuit sampling or cosentropy benchmarking is an estimator of the system fidelity and is an experiment that we want to do as we increase the number of qubits and, and reduce the errors to keep measuring what is the fidelity of the whole system. So let me give you a quick intuition for why um, these particular functions, um, like the linear cosentropy, is an estimator of fidelity. So this is what we do. Let's look at this term with a depth set. Um, we just do an average over the samples. We do an average of the normalized ideal probabilities. And the samples are come in the simplified model. Again, you can use the other slightly more general model, but let's just keep this model in mind. In the simplified model, the samples come from some noisy distribution, which is a mixture of the ideal probabilities with the uniform distribution. So then if you average um, these numbers, when you're sampling with these probabilities, then you get two terms. Okay, let's look at this term first. This term just comes from here, from the noise, which we're modeling as a globally depolarizing channel or a uniform distribution. So you just get the sum of the probabilities from here, the two to the n, cancels this two to the n. So it's just the sum of the ideal probabilities, which is one, right? And then this other term, well, this other term is actually, you have some ideal probability here because you're sampling with some fidelity f from the ideal distribution, but then you're averaging these numbers which have another ideal probability. So you get probabilities a square. So this term is the second moment of the distribution. And here is the distribution, which is an exponential distribution. The second moment is different from the first moment. So then this term is different from that term. And then um, you just need to offset by one to really extract the parameter f. So that's an intuition. You can do similar math with uh, the logarithmic microcentropy, but the point or other functions, but the point is that um, the ideal sampling gives you a different um, a different result because your average in ideal probabilities gives you a second moment. So it gives you a different result at the first moment. So that's how cross entropy benchmarking works. And under fairly general conditions, then it gives you an estimator of the fidelity, which is very important for us. Great. So now um, let me um, present the, the results of this experiment that we just did again. Uh, so we use 70 qubits. The x-axis here is the depth of the circuit, so the layers of two qubit gates. And the y-axis is the fidelity, the probability of an error that we estimate, as I just explained, with cross-entry benchmarking. So 70 qubits um, is kind of too many qubits to calculate the ideal probabilities uh, comfortably, or actually we don't know how to do it, at least not at these depths. So we cannot do cross entropy benchmarking for the full system, but we can break the system in two patches, calculate the fidelity of each patch, right? Because it's now only 35 qubits, we can calculate the probabilities and then multiply them. So that's what we do at different depths. And those are the green dots, for instance. Or we can do three patches. And well, when we move from two to three, we remove some gates. So it's a slightly higher fidelity. So blue is with three patches. And what is very important is that um, we can say, well, the fidelity, as I was saying, you expect it to be the probability of having no errors. So you can multiply the fidelity of all the gates in your system, so the probability of not having an error in any component. And that should more or less correspond to the fidelity that we measure with cross entropy benchmarking. If everything goes well, if we don't introduce crosstalk or things like that. And this very simpler model, which is what we call the discrete error model, just multiply the fidelities of the gates. That's the continuous line. And it more or less agrees in the two patches and three patches with what we measure with cross entropy. And then finally, we take data with uh, 70 qubits, with these like 70 million bit strings that um, we put online. Uh, at depth 24, we cannot really calculate the fidelity, but we just put the bit strings out there. So we did the same in 2019. People have actually been able to check the fidelities we were able to do at the time, so that's been great. So here's a new result. Um, and again, in a nutshell, as I said at the beginning, um, we're redoing the same experiment as 2019, but now with 70 qubits instead of 53 and uh, 700 gates or multi-qubit gates, and we obtain a similar fidelity as in 2019. 
And this is the non-phase match case, meaning we're not controlling the these phases I was talking about from the two qubit gates. If we control the phases, which we can do now because um, we upgrade our software and things like that, uh, we get a slightly worse fidelity. We lost like a factor of two in the fidelity because we have to do some things to remove these extra phases that we get from the two qubit gates. But it's not too bad. This is still, um, I think it's 0.07%. Um, it's okay. We lose a factor of two. Before it was uh, 0.17% if we do, if we don't do face matching with face matching, so it's fully controllable or fully controlled gate set is 0.07%. Um, okay, so how were we able to scale this experiment? Um, well, we reduce the error rates in all the components without introducing crosstalk or things like that. So we can compare the single qubit error rates in 2019 to 2022, so what we just did. And we got, uh, well, it improved by 30%, so now it's like around 10 to the minus four. The two qubit error rates, and these are, by the way, poly errors when would you do errors in all the qubits at the same time. The two qubit gate set improved by 35%, and the readout improved by a larger factor of uh, two thirds, um, uh, 66%. So by improving errors in the components and scaling the experiment a little bit, we were able to do this experiment with much bigger volume if you want. So now uh, is when we compare with the um, um, all known algorithms. So the algorithm that works best, and there has been a lot of nice improvement on this algorithm for random circuit sampling, but it's a more general algorithm, is tensor network contraction. So let me explain you a little bit how tensor network contraction works to simulate quantum circuits. Again, it's, a, it's kind of a more generic algorithm. So here's my quantum circuit where this is my initial state. This is some output bit stream for which I want to calculate the ideal probability according to this circuit. And these boxes here are the two qubit gates. So this is just my circuit. And now I want to think of all my gates as tensors with two input indexes and two output indexes. So what you do to do a tensor level contraction, well, you have all these tensors, you group them in some way that you kind of have to optimize. So this is hard to do in general. And that's one of the things that have improved a lot in this paper how you choose the order in which you contract your tensors. But once you choose the order, you basically contract these tensors and you get some tensor with some more indexes. It's just a bigger tensor. And you just keep redoing these grouping tensors and contracting them until you contract all the tensors and then you get an amplitude. So this is just a, an overview of how the algorithm works. Um, again, um, the devil is in the details and these details have improved a lot in the last few years. Um, so uh, we take all these details and improve them a bit more, and we can calculate basically um, what is the number of flops uh, with the latest tensor network contraction improvements and a bit more to calculate a single amplitude. So to do the process that I just explained to you, just in flops, um, assuming that you have infinite memory. So no constraints in memory, yes, the flops. And um, we see that in flops, um, the new experiment is uh, six orders of magnitude more expensive than in 2019. These numbers are now quite stable because I think we think we have a fairly good handle on how to choose optimal contraction orders if you ignore memory constraints. Here you have a plot of how the computational cost in flops has been improving from our first experiment here, two experiments from USDC. And here's the new experiment. Uh, so you see a nice improvement of computational cost over the years. Uh, you can also introduce memory constraints and efficiency numbers and, and, and try to get an estimate of what would be the time it will take to sample a million bit strings, noisy samples um, in something like Frontier, which is the largest supercomputer. You have to do reaction sampling, which is a small overhead from going between amplitudes and samplers uh, because you're sampling actually, uh, but it's not a big overhead, but there are a lot of um, extra tricks when you do a million samples. So these numbers are a little bit more fluffy, they might still improve. But anyway, taking all the non-improvements and improving them, improving them a bit more ourselves, um, like we're giving estimates which are an order of magnitude better than the best estimates. We think that the latest experiment we're presenting will take around 50 years in a frontier. So this is a plot of um, the computational hardness measuring flops, uh, where the x-axis is the number of qubits and the y-axis is the depth. 
And if you take some fixed number of qubits, let's say here should be 70, which is this experiment. Initially, as you increase the depth, the computational cost changes a lot. So the different lines are flops, right? So you see a big change in cost, so exponential actually increasing cost as you increase depth until it kind of saturates around this point. So that means your state is maximally entangled and then adding more depth does not increase the cost exponentially because it's just linear. Basically you just have the full wave function now and adding an extra gate is just a linear increasing cost. So you want to make sure that you are at least this depth within these boundaries. Well, it's at least a square root of n depth. So that's why our circuits are pretty deep to make sure that we're here. And yeah, and then the rest gives you an idea of, uh, you know, how the cost will change if you change the number of qubits for depth sort of keeping the same fidelity. Okay, so another um, very important algorithm is based on um, matrix product state simulations. So let me give you a, an idea of how that works. Um, so here is the, your initial state and then you're applying uh, gates. So you get uh, an output state, right? So this is just a state vector. Um, so what you do, then inspired by matrix product states is you want to break this state vector into two halves. And to break them into two halves, you get some indexes in the middle. You normally do this if you can with a singular value decomposition. And these indexes are related to the singular values. And the reason why you want to do that is because if there is not a lot of entanglement, then uh, you can remove a lot of the singular values because they're very small if there is no entanglement. And you get, um, a state now, which is, well, to st store the full state vector is order two to the n in memory. But here, if you only keep chi um, indexes here in what is called the bond dimension, sorry, this will be an n over two. This is a two n over two uh, indexes here because it's half of the, sorry about that, two n over two times chi, which is the bond dimension. So if I, if, if you mind the n over two there, this state can be a lot easier to store than this state. And the trick here is you have to, um, if you want, ideally do a singular value composition and drop um, drop singular values. But then if you drop too many of them, then you start paying a price. So the fidelity drops and the fidelity drops uh, sort of uh, ideally the square of the singular values that the fidelity is the square of the singular values that you keep up to whatever is your bond dimension. If you order them and just keep the larger ones, which is what you want to do. So um, turns out that then, um, well, it's important to study this type of simulation. So this is new in this paper inspired by, uh, actually these are the references. Uh, people, I mean, work out these algorithms for random circuit sampling. So what we have done is, well, first of all, we derive an inequality, which probably was known already. Um, so just based on Jensen's inequality, you can bound the fidelity of uh, your reduced state as after you drop, um, Singular values, you can drop the, you can bound the fidelity as the square root of just this is analytical, the square root of chi, which is the bond dimension, times the, the square. Uh, this is the purity of the reduced density matrix. So the reduced density matrix of, of this half or this other half, the, the purity of the reduced density matrix is kind of a measure of entanglement. So this is analytical bound. Okay, so what is interesting is if you remember, these were our single qubit gates in the discrete gate set, which were either Cliffords or non-Cliffords. And it turns out that if we drop the non-Clifford, then the average reduced purity is the same as if we keep the non-Clifford gates. But if we do I swaps with the, these Clifford gates, then we can calculate it um, efficiently, what is the reduced purity, because then it's all Clifford. So we can calculate efficiently the reduced purity of Clifford circuits. So the average is the same with Cliffords and non-Cliffords. So Long story short, with numerics, we can calculate this number efficiently for a given depth in average. And so, so that's what we're gonna do. Um, we also derive another bound for the fidelity, but this one is numerical. We basically get rid of the square root and at a factor of four there. Anyway, so uh, these are the plots for what is the computational cost of this um, to make sure that we're protected against these kind of algorithms and we have very high entanglement. So um, Let's just look at the numerical bound if you want. So as before on the tensor networks, the x-axis is the number of qubits and the y-axis is the depth of number of cycles of two qubit gates. And uh, as before, the, this is just memory, by the way. We're not saying how you do the single variable composition or anything like that. This is sort of the minimum memory that you need. 
uh, which we bound with this numerical bound on the bond dimension. And at 70 qubits, we say, well, once you're here in this experiment that we just did, uh, the numerical bound tells us that you need more memory that you could fit on Frontier, even if you use external storage. And you see the same feature as with tensor networks that initially the memory required changes a lot, but once you saturate entanglement or saturate, you know, you don't win anything but going to more depth because you're already, this is just to doing one truncation of MPS, um, you know, adding more, more depth doesn't really help. Great, so this is um, all I wanted to say. And now Kosti is gonna talk about this um, noise induced phase transition. Kosti, you wanna try to share your screen or shall I? Try to keep going from my end. Uh, I will try to share. Uh, you cannot... Yeah, you need to stop sharing this code so I can do it. So uh, do you see my slides? Yeah, it's good. OK. Uh, yeah, so I will um, talk about noise and use phase transition. And uh, the relationship to what Sergio was talking about will hopefully become clear uh, as I go. Um, and the idea is this. We are looking at random circuits. And uh, uh, in random circuits, what we do is uh, we start with a product state and apply uh, random single qubit gates and uh, fixed two qubit gates. And we apply them in our local architecture. Uh, so in 1D, it would be a brick layer with a uh, uh, order of gates as shown here. And we take this uh, circuit uh, sufficiently long. The idea being that we uh, want to prepare an approximately uniformly random vector from the Hilbert space. And this, uh, it's a typical state from a Hilbert space is nearly maximally entangled. And this is kind of one of the ways of thinking of uh, why uh, it is hard to simulate the output of, uh, of a random circuit. Uh, however, in real device, we have noise. And uh, noise drives the system towards a maximally mixed state, which is a product state. So it kind of counteracts the uh, uh, what a random circuit is trying to do. So in reality, we have a competition of these two processes. And the natural question arises is at, at what night noise level uh, we are using the Hilbert space of all of the qubits, right? Or in other ways, uh, uh, asking the same question is, can a smaller number of qubits have the same computational power? Right? And this is what I try to answer. Uh, one way to answer this question is uh, using linear XZB, uh, because this is an estimator of fidelity. I'll quickly remind you. Uh, that what, when we, what we do when we calculate linear XZB, we take bit strings observed in the experiment, calculate probabilities for a given circuit for them, and calculate this quantity uh, here, uh, averaged over observed uh, bit strings. This can be thought of as uh, averaging over actual experimental distribution over bit strings. And using this formula, yeah, as, as Sergio already explained, we can analyze a very simple instructive uh, example which is an example of global depolarizing channel model of the noise right, that uh, Sergio introduced in detail. Uh, it's basically saying that our density matrix is a, a fidelity times the uh, random state we wanted to prepare plus uh. Sorry, Kostya, I think we lost you. So we can see your video, Kostya, well, uh, sorry, the, the screen, but so how your image is frozen and we cannot hear you anymore. Uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, so now I, I can, I guess, continue if it's better. It seems like internet, <laughs> interestingly. 
is slow. Uh, can I continue? Yes, please. Uh, uh, we, we don't see your slides now. Interesting. Yeah, that never happened before, but I guess. Uh, do you see my slides now? Uh, not yet. Uh, I did share the screen. Uh, you do not see the slides still. Uh, it says you have started screen sharing, but uh, oh. I, I don't see the slides yet. Hmm. Yeah, I am trying. I am sharing the whole screen. Third screen, share. Okay, hide. Try again. Uh, is this, do you see my slides? Uh, no, not yet. Huh. I am doing... Yeah, for some reason it doesn't share. Uh, let me see. Share. Share system audio. Okay. Interesting. It seems like I have the same issue as the as Sergio had. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Okay, it. I can see it now. Uh, do you see the now yeah. the full screen? Okay. Yes. So there is some trick here in the... Uh, okay, so I can continue. Uh, yeah, the idea is that uh, from global depolarizing channel, we can expect XZB to equal to fidelity. However, of course, the noise in our devices is local. It's quite far from that. And in this talk, we will be interested in the boundary between the regime where XZB converges to fidelity and when XZB doesn't converge to fidelity. And uh, how does it connect it to the point with which I started? I will say that this is actually, this boundary is closely related to that question, that how many qubits are actually useful uh, at a given level of noise. And uh, it will be instru instructing to consider uh, the simplified model, which we call the weak link model, and the first in one dimensions. And this uh, model is uh, consists of two we, we split the system a one-dimensional system of qubits where these crosses are qubits and uh, rectangles are couplers between them we split them into two parts a and b equal to each other and to each of the parts we apply the brick layer uh, random circuit with noise and uh, we treat this uh, uh, coupler between the two sub subsystems a and b as special and apply it with some different period t different from other uh, gates and we'll vary this uh, T. And uh, we will characterize the noise by this fidelity of a layer of gates, which scales with the number of qubits n and the uh, error per qubit per unit time. So we can understand two uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, limiting cases uh, using perturbation theory. This was uh, actually convergence of perturbation theory was analyzed previously uh, theoretically. Um, so we can say that for, for example, for a limit of t equals two, this period t equals two, which means that this uh, red gate is actually not special at all. It's applied uh, in the same brick layer fashion as every other gate. Uh, for weak enough noise, so we know that the uh, depolarizing channel, there is convergence to depolarizing channel model. So the density matrix can be written in this form where row AB is a ideal density matrix of the whole system A and B. And uh, it uh, is multiplied by a fidelity where we apply D layers of gates. So F to the D. And we, as I showed before, and, and Serge also, that the XZB in this case is fidelity. Uh, more interesting is the opposite limit if a period is infinite. And in this case, uh, we uh, expect that A and B are independent from each other. So the density matrix is a product. At the same time, because we apply a random circuit, uh, 
we can uh, uh, again at sufficiently low noise expect that each subsystem converges to depolarizing channel. So the density matrix of the whole system is a product of the two depolarizing channel expressions. Now, if we substitute this into the XZB, we get this expression, which is not just the fidelity of the whole system, but also this additional term, which uh, has a slower exponent. And this additional term originates from uh, uh, contributions here in the density matrix that have a, a, a form of a maximally mixed state in half the system and then a, a ideal random vector that we wanted to prepare in the other half of the system. And there are two contributions like that. And also you can notice immediately that in, uh, the maximally mixed state is immune to noise. So the fidelity of such contributions will be square root of the fidelity of the whole system because this is half the system. And the second term actually dominates. So we see that XZB is actually converges to something uh, very different from fidelity. And the reason for that is because our uh, state of the system is actually a product state. It's very far from what we expect uh, you know, from a random state in a Hilbert space. Now uh, we can uh, now consider a more interesting uh, case of this uh, period being large but not infinite. And in this case, we can solve the model. Uh, and uh, this uh, expression for infinite uh, period is modified in a very simple way, where in the second term, we have an additional factor lambda, which is applied every time we apply the uh, disentangling gate bridging uh, subsystems A and B. And this lambda is a uh, coefficient between zero and one. And it means uh, physically, basically one minus lambda is the probability for A and B to be entangled uh, after we apply this uh, bridging gate. And uh, so lambda is kind of uh, a, a probability to stay in the product state. Now we have a XZB that uh, is a sum of two terms, both of them scale exponentially with D. Uh, so this is a competition of two exponents. Uh, so we can uh, see that depending on the, on the ratio between the basis of these exponents, the XZB either converges to fidelity or converges to something else. And we can call this a weak noise regime where XZB converges to fidelity and strong noise regime. And we already see that this is an exponential switch between the two exponentials, and this is a, a, a sharp switch, right? So indicative of a phase transition. To make it even clearer, we can introduce an order parameter, which is a fidelity divided by XZB. This is the fidelity of the whole system divided by XZB. And I just repeat the expression for the XZB here. And we expect for this ratio to converge to one in the weak noise regime, where uh, first uh, the term is dominant and uh, converge to zero because uh, fidelity is much smaller than XZB in the strong noise regime. And uh, uh, we can uh, uh, study the behavior of this order parameter as a function of the noise strength so this on the vertical axis, I show this order parameter, and the horizontal axis is the noise strength. Again, this is error per unit time, so it scales uh, with n number of qubits. And uh, uh, at very low noise, so at zero here, we expect this uh, order parameter to be one at a very large noise to be zero, and in between is a crossover. And this uh, crossover uh, becomes sharper and sharper as we take longer and longer depth. Right, as we would expect from the analytical expression. And these uh, lines here, colored lines, are numerical simulations of the uh, actual microscopic model, where D, the color, corresponds to a different depth from uh, cyan being 10 to all the way to black 55. So we see that uh, the, this crossover becomes sharper and sharper as we take D larger. And at infinite depth, it becomes a, a true discontinuity. So this is a uh, signatures of finite size critical scaling, a signature of this uh, discontinuous uh, phase transition. And this is also a, a good way to identify, actually a convenient way to identify a transition point in the experiment, as we will do later. Now, we can now uh, construct a phase diagram, remembering that this uh, we defined a fidelity per layer as this uh, quantity in terms of uh, error per qubit per unit time. Uh, so the critical uh, noise strength corresponds to this uh, basis of two exponents equal to each other. And for uh, the gate we are using, I-swap gates, this entangling bridge gate is I-swap. We can calculate lambda explicitly. It's one quarter. And we obtain explicit expression for the critical uh, noise strength. 
as a function of this t, the period with which we apply uh, the, the gate. And we can compare this. Uh, well, now we can construct a phase diagram uh, where on the horizontal axis, again, this is the controls parameter, which is the error per unit time. And the vertical is this uh, frequency, one over period of application of entangling gate. And the solid line is this expression, analytical expression, separating the strong noise and weak noise regimes. And the blue dots here are the numerical simulation of microscopic models. And we see that uh, at a very low frequency, where we expect this analytics to work well, indeed the uh, numerics and analytics, uh, analytics coincide. And uh, as we as the this link frequency approaches 0.5, where 0.5 corresponds to period two, so this is the where uh, this uh, bridge is actually not special at all; it's uh, just a regular one-dimensional chain. So here we see some deviation, which means that uh, from, from the anal simple analytics, this means that the, that the internal dynamics of the of the uh, each half of the each subsystem becomes important. Right? But more importantly, we still kind of see that qualitative features, so the existence of this transition uh, extends from this weekly model all the way to 1D chain. And uh, the question, of course, our experiments that Sergio was describing are in two dimensions, and we can <coughs> ask the same question numerically so we can construct a phase diagram where again the horizontal axis is the error per unit time and the vertical is the number of links we are applying and with such that uh, in the here and the lowest values we're gonna look at is we're applying only one link between left and right uh, but applying it uh, with the periodicity of our circuit and then uh, uh, all the way to applying all of the links across the device and we see that the dependence of the how many links we apply is actually quite weak. We also study different sizes. So this the different shapes correspond to different symbols correspond to the different sizes. We see that change is not that big. And we study different gate patterns. This is a way to different choices of how we apply uh, groups of two qubit gates in parallel. And uh, this is also doesn't lead leads only to a small change in the uh, location of the phase transition. So based on uh, all of these studies and different parameter, uh, different details, we can draw a, a, a lower bound on the critical noise, which we, uh, on this plot, assume vertical, again, because the dependence on the link was uh, weak. So it's kind of, it seems like it's a bulk effect. And we can therefore extrapolate this diagram to a larger systems, right? Now we can do an uh, experiment. Uh, I don't know if I should keep going or uh, I should wrap up at this point. Uh, why, why don't you finish up? Uh, how long would it take you? Um, maybe f f five minutes. Yeah, that's that's fine. Please, uh, please, uh, yeah, finish. So these were, yeah, short numerical simulations. We want to verify that this actually goes on in our experiment. And for that, we need to add noise in the experiment to control, to, to tune. Of course, we, we already make the lowest noise possible for these experiments. So we can only go into larger noise. And this is done by including this random uh, small angle rotations, where angles are choos chosen in such a way that they match the single qubit error we want. And then we can uh, now control in the experiment this uh, horizontal axis, so the strength of the uh, error per, uh, per unit time. And we can uh, use this order parameter and the crossing point <coughs> in this final size scaling <coughs> to identify the transition points for different t, different periods of the applying the link between uh, subsystems and we see that it, it lies pretty close to what we expect uh, theoretically and numerically and we can repeat the same in 2d and see that the, the results are uh, consistent also in two dimensions and the interesting question is of course where on this uh, phase diagram is the 70 qubit uh, uh, experiment that uh, Sergio was discussing and just calculating the parameters, we can put the star, which is the location of this uh, 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 in this phase diagram where our system is. So we can conclude that this well within the weak noise regime, right? Given that we uh, uh, define this boundary, and uh, 
Uh, so in this sense, uh, the, the, what we are measuring, the XZB actually me measures the fidelity of all 70 qubits. And in that sense, you need all of, all of the 70 qubits are being used, right? Uh, you cannot uh, get this with uh, 69 qubits, for example. Uh, so uh, formally, this transition can be uh, justified. Uh, uh, and this is done by uh, analyzing the circuit average linear XZB for which there is an exact mapping after circuit average, the quantity, the linear XZP that's defined here again, it maps exactly onto a, a partition function of a classical model. So for n qubit system depth D, the, the classical spin model will be n times D. And uh, uh, the partition function, so, so, so the correspondence is kind of, uh, to give you a flavor, it's shown here. We have uh, qubits, uh, single two qubit gates and measurement. And on the right side, we will have, instead of qubits, we'll have sites, which can be in one of the two classical states uh, for a simplified version or for a, a actual model that describes the experiment, three states actually. And uh, uh, each uh, 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 entangling gate corresponds here to a four spin interaction, which we can obtain explicitly. And the measurement corresponds to local field. And more, most importantly, in this model, we can explicitly include noise, which is an analog of a, a local field as well. And therefore, analyzing this partition function, if we find we find a discontinuity in the first derivative, so this is a first or the first transition. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we can define uh, carefully the thermodynamic limits for this phase transition in this in this setting. Uh, now, why is this phase transition, uh, noise-induced phase transition, remarkable? Yeah, the answer is here in this blue box. Noise-induced phase transition is an out-of-equilibrium quantum phase transition that is sharp at finest noise per unit time. Uh, now, this out-of-equilibrium quantum phase transitions have attracted a lot of attention in the physics uh, community, condensed matter in particular. It's a, uh, it's a transition that happens in the wave function it usually doesn't have uh, standard thermodynamic signatures uh, or signatures in spectrum the examples are many body localization or measurement induced phase transitions and uh, uh, for most of these transitions what happens is that noise is detrimental like they are broadened by noise and become crossovers however in our case the noise is a control parameter and the transition remains as uh, sharp uh, in the, uh, at finite noise uh, there is an uh, there was a proposal uh, or analysis rather of a, a rather different transition but similar in, in spirit uh, in this paper by Dorita Ronov, and uh, to see that it's a kind of different mechanism the noise at which that transition happens is uh, much larger than the noise we are talking about, like the the noise induced phase transition I discussed in this. Uh, token that we are identifying in this case is really happens near the maximal entanglement in the whole system. Uh, and that's uh, kind of the, the novelty, right, for it. Now, to conclude, we uh, uh, use the linear XZB across entropy uh, to identify first order phase transition in the, that is uh, uh, basically a change in, an abrupt change in the dynamics of the system that distinguishes this weak and strong noise regimes. Uh, we can we put a lower bound on this in uh, two dimensions, and we show that uh, our 70 qubit experiments in, an, in a weak noise regime. Uh, uh, and we can observe this experiment uh, experimentally in this transition. And uh, uh, at the end, though, we can also uh, say that there is implications for spoofing algorithms. There is an analogous, basically, of similar origin phase transition of the first order, separating the circuits that can be spoofed and then cannot be spoofed. And uh, I'll leave this for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, um, are there any questions before we move on? Uh, hi, hi, hi. Can yeah, I ask you? Yeah, hi, Emo. Yes, please. Uh, thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks for the ni very nice talk. Uh, I just want to understand a little bit more about this uh, noise-induced transition in the uh, 
picture of classical stack model. You mentioned that this is a noise induced first order transition. So as uh, as I would imagine, that's a competition between two symmetry breaking fields. Uh, I guess one of the symmetry breaking field is your noise. And I'm wondering what is the other symmetry breaking field? Or, or am I right about this understanding uh, as a phase tra first order transition? Yes, I mean, it is, it is a competition between uh, two exponents, right? And uh, one exponent is uh, uh, just a fidelity. And the other exponent is a combination of the uh, kind of the, the rate at which your uh, circuit converges to its quantum chaos. Uh, it, and the and, uh, effect of noise, right? And, and some fidelity. So in this two, two simple weak link model, I had the second term, which contained lambda and the half system fidelity, right? So this is the competition between oh. those these two processes. Oh, so you mean the, uh, the the tuning parameter T is serving as another symmetry breaking view? Uh, capital T, the, 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 the frequency of applying a weak link between two sides. Yes, it can. It also controls the the location of the transition. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll have to think about that. Okay. Uh, if 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 I have time, can I ask another quick question? So you, when when you do your finite size scaling, you are it seems that you are only tuning the depths rather, uh, but not tuning the system size. Have you also tried tuning the system size and see how the crossing goes? Yeah. Yeah. This this diagram. Yes. Yes, it, it also becomes uh, sharper, right? Uh, uh, well, okay. So if we if we fix uh, epsilon n, the question is how do we uh, scale? Yeah, if I still allow n to vary, then this will be becoming sharper and sharper, also exponentially. And they, they cross at the same point. Uh, yes, for this weakling model, they are. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but this is not actually necessary. In general, the, the, this can be uh, broadened a little bit. Uh, the, the, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's there's another question. Let me give you permission to ask the question, Jar. Could you go ahead and ask the question? <laughs> um, do you wish to, okay, pass her in the, in the webinar? Would you like to, you have your hand raised, would you like to ask a question? I think you're muted. Okay, um, all right, so maybe uh, if there are no further questions. Uh, uh, okay. Um, Maybe if you can stop sharing your slides and we can move on to the panel, um, Kostya. So, um, great, uh, let's, um, okay, so as, as the videos are being pinned up for the panelists, let me, let me start introducing the panelists. Uh, um, we have uh, Sunwan Choi from MIT. Uh, uh, Sunwan uh, did his PhD at Harvard. Uh, he was a Miller Fellow here at Berkeley, now at MIT. Uh, He's, he works on strongly interacting quantum many body systems and he's, he's thought extensively about um, random circuit sampling and phase transitions in them. So very appropriate for this. Um, um, it's uh, Bill Pfefferman, uh, many of you have already seen here. Bill um, uh, got his PhD at Caltech, was a, was a postdoc here at Berkeley and is now on, uh, on the faculty at University of Chicago. Uh, Bill, um, works on complexity theory, but, but he's, I think, one of, uh, one of the people who knows um, the most about complexity of random circuit sampling. And, and uh, so again, um, great to have you here, Bill. And then um, 
Uh, our last panelist is uh, Alex uh, Delzo, who um, got his PhD from Caltech and then and is now at AWS. So Alex did uh, did this uh, very nice work with uh, Fernando Brandau on uh, how local depolarizing noise leads to this the kind of global depolarizing channel uh, that uh, Sergio and Kostya spoke about. So. Um, um, so shall we start the panel by just getting getting your reactions, uh, you know, comments on the talk, and and we can start that off as a as a discussion. Should I start? Uh, yeah, sure, please. Yeah, maybe I can start. Um, um, thank you so much for Sergio and Constantia for for the amazing talk, and also I'm very happy that you know I can watch this talk in real time. And see how the our experimental efforts to you know improve our quantum chipset is getting improved. Um, certainly, I'm shocked at how good the quantum device is. At the same time, it seems like this new observation of noise-induced phase transition uh, is very interesting. But at the same time, as we will discuss further, I have a few kind of unresolved questions that I would like to discuss further, especially regarding the notion of phase transition and the notion of what it means it cannot be spoofed. So maybe we will delay, you know, like talking about those questions uh, at the later stage, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go next, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Sun Wan. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, so thanks for the very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really like seeing these sort of larger uh, and, and sort of more sophisticated, uh, less noisy random quantum circuit experiments. I think it's really important if only uh, sort of as a means of benchmarking, right? To try to, uh, you know, compare in sort of an apples to apples manner, sort of successive generations of, uh, you know, um, uh, of quantum experiments uh, that the Google team is doing. Um, and I think from that perspective, you know, these results about sort of when, you know, when in terms of the, the you know, noise rates, uh, we're seeing correspondence between XEB and fidelity, you know, is 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 really important, right? Because fidelity is a very important quantum benchmark. Um, you know, and uh, but it's not sample efficient. And and XEB, you can uh, you can estimate with far you know far fewer samples. And so I think there's every indication that XEB is going to be a really important measure for us as we sort of go forward. Um, you know, in fact, it's so important. One thing I want to say from the get go is that we have you know it, together with a uh, uh, you know, really smart group of researchers at uh, UMD, and we've actually been able to see similar things. Um, and I think we'll have a paper uh, forthcoming uh, where we're really studying, um, you know, exactly what XEB has to do with fidelity and in what situations we, we hope to see it. But I think we're mostly in agreement. The one thing I want to say, though, in terms of complexity, is I think the situation is a little bit more nuanced. I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, maybe the, the the main message I'm getting from many of these talks on noisy random circuit sampling is just that, you know, when I think about the power of noisy random circuits, it's really a multi-parameter problem. You know, there's not a single answer. The, 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 the answer really depends on what do we mean by noise, right? I mean, in our first um, in our first paper, you know, on this on this subject with Umesh and Adam and and, and so on, you know, we weren't really thinking about noise at all. We were asking this much simpler question: if you you know implement essentially a perfect noise list system, you know, is there is there a signal or not? Uh, you know, and that was not obvious at all. And now we're asking this question: you know, can we model the noise realistically? And is there you know a, a complexity theoretic sense in which it's hard? And I think that really depends on what you mean. You know, I think what what noise are you talking about? Are you talking about depolarizing noise in particular? Are you talking about other noise, correlated noise, unital noise, or non-unital noise? I think we're discovering that all of these things are important. What is the noise strength, right? So I think that's one of the main differences that we were talking here. Are we talking about constant noise strength that doesn't change as the system size grows? Or does the noise get sort of, um, in some sense, better as the system size grows? Does it scale like some constant over the system size? Which means as the system size is getting larger, the noise in some sense is getting, is getting less. Um, you know, um, are we talking about finite size systems or are we talking about scaling? Right. Uh, and I think what we're learning is that all of these things matter um, and they matter a lot. Uh, it really depends on uh, you know, if we get easiness, uh, classical easiness, uh, like we saw you know, a few months back. I think there was a really great colloquium here at the Simons Institute where we were looking at um, where, you know, um, Yun Chao and, and Dori Taharanov and Umesh and others were thinking about constant noise rate depolarizing uh, noise. Um, in the asymptotic setting, right? And there they had a very nice algorithm that got easiness. 
uh, classical easiness. Um, but of course, here we're, we're, we're talking about something completely different and the answer might be different. So to me, I think it just matters how are we modeling um, you know, this sort of very complicated uh, you know, phenomenon of quantum noise in a complexity theoretic setting. And I think what we're learning more and more every day is it just really depends on uh, what we're modeling. So that, that's sort of my takeaway in the complexity department. Yeah, cool. Um, maybe I'll just make one uh, additional comment following up on that. Um, yeah, I guess like it's nice that they, rather than just kind of repeating the old experiment with a bigger system and like, uh, you know, better gates, they've actually kind of done gone further and analyzed this whole phase transition stuff. And I think it really highlights how random circuit sampling is, you know, while it may not have a, di a direct practical application that's obvious, it's really kind of a test bed for like all of these very fundamental questions of like hardness and like what's going on with this noise. And so I think like, I really appreciate that they've kind of tried to focus on this in the in this iteration of, of things. And uh, while I think what Bill said is definitely right that like there's all these dimensions and we still have so much to understand, I think it's nice to see like a building consensus maybe um, uh, between like this paper he mentioned earlier where we know now that at constant uh, error rate per you know per gate, so this would be an extensive number of errors per cycle. Uh, there is a you know polynomial time algorithm that that works, and here kind of now there's a consensus that if the noise is is weak enough in this kind of simplified model where we're only having a small constant number of errors per cycle, then uh, there's kind of a more robust argument for uh, hardness. Um, and or there's this whole space in between, and there's all these different kinds of noise, like Bill was saying, but um, you know, I think we're kind of, as a community, maybe um, understanding it better, which is encouraging. Yeah, I would also like to definitely talk about the spoofing stuff that um, Sun Wan uh, was alluding to, because I was also curious to hear, that, especially Sun Wan's take on on this. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess the the question for me was like, uh, yeah, it seems clear that there's some some sort of transition of some kind, you know. Uh, uh, going on between a very weak noise regime and like a stronger noise regime that's still a constant over n uh, 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 error rate per gate. Um, but I guess yeah, once you cross over into the into the strong noise regime, I guess it's very unclear to me uh, what's going on. Like it, it seems like the fidelity is no longer the or the the XEB is no longer going to match up with the um, uh, right the the probability of having no errors over the whole algorithm, this like F to the D quantity, but uh, do we know that suddenly it becomes easy in some sense or like there is a way to spoof? And I guess conversely in this very weak noise regime, do we know that you can't spoof? Um, neither of these seem obvious to me, um, but yeah, I think the other panelists could maybe say better. Yeah, um, go ahead and tell, go ahead, someone and Bill. Yeah, so, um... So let, let's let's try to open up like one one discussion point. It's regarding the benchmarking. We, we we use the same word benchmarking, but I recently learned actually not recently, like I learned one year ago that actually means two different things depending on the different community. One is benchmarking the capable you know hardware you know correctness, how good this quantum device is you know compared to say fidelity is one or not. Um, the other one is benchmarking computation power. You know, how does it compare against you know classical computer doing similar tasks where the task needs to be well defined? I think this is a little subtle, but this is sharply different. It's a conceptually different notion because one is computational aspect, the other one is more hardware aspect. So like I mean both very interesting, but somehow like I think we should not kind of mix up those two concepts. Let's focus on the first one first. Like uh, you know, checking that hardware is behaving in a way that we expect it to behave. So I do have a question for uh, Sergio. So okay, like if we talk to ex experimentalist, one of the obvious things that we should try is either of the two: either you forward evolve in unitary and then apply inverse unitary and come back to the initial state and see how well it comes back to the original state. Second task is, it seems like you guys have already simulated the clipper circuit. And the clipper circuit 
form 3 design for the qubit. Therefore, we can efficiently do the XEB even for the all connected connectivity, like regardless of the geometry. So I was wondering whether we have considered actually using either Clifford or the, the kind versus you know, unitaries to check the, the, the expected behavior from the quantum chipset. And if it's not, then I would like to learn about what the difficulty is doing so. Yeah, so the first one doing a loss with echo, um, that one, um, actually, Costa can tell you about that because that has done. Be, we have done that, um, but you have to change the gates a little bit. So, in the gates that we use to sort of get the maximum computational power, you know, because we're indeed doing the both benchmarks, as you say, right here. We care about both of them. We we care about fidelity, so system errors, but we also care about the computational cost benchmark. So to maximize the computational cost benchmark. We use these ISWAP light gates, so they have this extra control C phase, and that makes them harder to invert because you, ha you have this extra phase. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to invert if you just declare that to be an ISWAP because you know it, it kind of inverts with single qubit gates. So that's what was done on the what we call the information scrambling experiment and experiments like that and in, internally and it, you know it matches what you spat with this caveat right uh, so the reason why we don't you know do it here is uh, this extra phase that we keep um if, if, it, if you sorry does, does this extra phase is something you cannot eliminate in the in your circuit for the new chipset well you can eliminate it but at the cost of um lower fidelity. It's just the physical way that the gate is implemented. To kind of eliminate it, it turns out you have to make the gate longer. So there is kind of a compromise, you know, to get the higher possible fidelity, right? Those are just experimental control details of how the gate is physically implemented. Um, so you don't make it absolutely zero, but you can make it a smaller, but make it longer gates, but longer gates, they are longer. So, you know, T1 is still around. So they just have um, slightly lower fidelity. Um, which, so that's why do, we don't do it in this experiment, but um, you know, we have done it internally. It's probably reported an information scrambling paper, for instance, right, Kostya? Yeah. yeah. And the other question about Cliffords, um, you can do XCB with Cliffords, but there are you know, larger fluctuations. So the average will be the same, but you know, not like circuit by circuit. So then you have to do like a lot of circuits, um, and we actually didn't do that. It's the same in average, right? But you know, Clifford's used to eight by an order one, um, you know, kind of constant. Um, so you have to just average many circuits, which we didn't do. Yeah, but sorry, I'm confused. I guess we could do. Um, is, isn't the amount of fluctuations differ only by a factor of maybe three or four, like some order one factor? Because it's a three design? Um, I don't know. To be honest, and also you need to use eye swaps, which is what we're not using. We still have this control C phase, right? That's right. But but the one, right. the one comment that I wanted to make is, as a theorist, you know, instead of I mean, at some region we need to go to the region we cannot simulate. I totally see that. But here it's done by having two different patching, like half half, one third, one third, one third. Right. But maybe what makes like the theorist happier would be. Exactly the same geometry, but one is an ensemble of Clifford, and the other one is just imprint some phases in a controlled fashion. Just change the content of the circuit without changing the geometry or the, any architecture of the circuit. Um, but otherwise, remains exactly the same and they maintain the same fidelity. That would be amazing. We actually did that in back in 2021, the science that I was citing on one of the slides. We did exactly that for, we were not measuring XZB, we were measuring a very closely related quantity, which is out of time order correlator for local uh, operators. <clears throat> and you can think of linear XZB as just sum over all possible out of time order correlators. Uh, so we, we actually did exactly that. We, we Out of time order correlator is actually plus or minus one for Clifford circuits. So it's very convenient, very easy to measure. And then as we, and we could control the content of the circuit by adding uh, T gates and controlling the number of T gates and then see the convergence and we could see uh, the change in the behavior, uh, particularly the average as we expect from 
uh, out of time order correlator and linear XZB were the same. So they averaged to the same value, but the fluctuations were different. And we could see that in experiment, how fluctuations depend on the, uh, so this is fourth moment, right? That is different in the, in the Clifford's and in the universal circuit, right? We could see how they depend on the content of the circuit. So yeah, please, uh, if you're interested, have a look and I'm happy to discuss more details about that, about that experiment. We also Sorry, need, but you know, back in 2019, elided circuits, right? Which is almost the same, but just removing a few gates. And those one we could simulate, not as easily as Clifford circuits, but we did that the first time, which I think in retrospect, it was a good idea because now we're realizing that, you know, you have to be very careful. Um, there's a big difference between patches and the full circuit because their per layer is very different. And, you know, we could have been on the brown side of the phase transition in 2019, but because we did this elided circuits, we know that we were in the right phase. Great. I, I'm wondering if I can maybe uh, go back to some pesky questions about complexity theory. Um, so, uh, so first of all, can I um, uh, just confirm when you're talking about complexity in this sort of, you know, in this particular regime in which the, you know, the noise is, uh, you know, uh, something like some constant over n, and you think that x e b corresponds to fidelity and so on. I assume what you what you mean is that for the sort of fixed system size and that fixed noise rate, that the sort of current state of the art you know, tensor network methods, um, you know, do not work well to simulate the system in uh, a small amount of human time as, as compared with running time. Um, is that is that how you're thinking about it? I just wanted to confirm. Well, there is a relation that, you know, I think will be a good idea to discuss, which we didn't quite explain <laughs> in the talk because it's kind of a bit technical to explain between, sure, like we do that, you know, we compare with tensor networks, but to compare with tensor networks, is more, you know, to just kind of get the best. Um, yeah. What 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 all of that is known, and you put it in some optimization formula, and you run, you know, large optimizations to basically find the best contraction orderings and uh, vertex projections and reorderings and things like that. So there are just a lot of tricks, and it's just numerics at that point. Now for the um, for the spoofing, there is a sort of a stronger relation between with uh, I think what you know Sumo was saying before, or or even like the algorithm from you know um, Omes and and, Reed and others, um, and that's just saying well you know um, I mean of course those spoofing attacks tend to be asymptotically and we agree you know that's why we're saying like the other parameter is error per layer you 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 know you cannot we agree you don't scale right many things break down if you scale and the number of qubits with constant error, mm -hmm. so that doesn't work. But if you have a low enough error per layer, then I think the fidelity that you get with the spoofing methods, and, and, and that's something we still talk about, is lower than the fidelity that we're reporting experimentally. And it's not quite the same transition, but it's, a, you know, it's, it's around the same point of in the transition. So I think that that may be something interesting to discuss. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually, I have a question along that line too. So the way I understood the talk is a phase transition of error per entire layer. Um, the, you know, depending on the amount of error, you have a uh, two different regimes where XCB closely follows the fidelity or XCB and then fidelity diverges, you know, as the depth increases, right? So. Okay, so that's that's very natural. In fact, I think it has been pointed out in several other papers. I, I, I don't remember all of them, but one of them is my own paper with Shun Gao. We, we, we studied that. So I'm not kind of, and that's very consistent, and I think that's a good understanding. But I'm confused about how it's related to the spoofing, because, because when it comes to spoofing, why are we spoofing? Like, what is the object being spoofed? Are, are we spoofing to achieve better XAB? Because like, you know, the here, so okay, the, could you answer that? Like, oh, when you say spoofing, like, what is the things that's being spoofed? So, I guess, I mean, the, in my mind, that everybody needs to be, but in my mind, the computational task is to sample from this model that I tried to explain a little bit at the beginning. You can simplify it to say you're sampling for a mixture of the ideal probabilities with, you know, identity that turns out not to be good enough for the experiment. So, then it's a mixture of something which looks like the, a mixture of the ideal probabilities with, uh, the maximum is state or the uniform distribution, but not quite. You have to allow for some tolerance there. 
And, and then the goal is to sample from that distribution with you know, some fidelity, which is like the mixture parameter in this picture F. Uh, but that's you know sort of a mouthful. So then I think it makes you know and it's instructive to just <laughs> you know for all of that let's let's you know at least in this case where like we're saying like we're in the weak noise regime we can define the fidelity and in, in most of the spoofing I think you end up it, it still makes sense to just use cross entropy as an estimator of the fidelity which is the parameter I kind of go around. So I think that's an interesting thing to study. You know spoofing means. Well, as long as you're, you know, you're sampling, I mean, because there are many things you can do to increment cross entropy, which is not sampling. Just calculate 100 probabilities, choose the large one, and just keep outputting that beta string. That's really not sampling. <laughs> and that, you know, is a way to maximize cross entropy. So there are some details that, anyway, this is the reason why I prefer to talk about the sampling per se. But anyway, um, it's still instructive to just keep going back to the cross entropy. And then I guess what we're trying to say is that um, the spoofing methods that we know about, um, you know, once you're in the weak noise regime, not exactly the transition that we're talking about, but a bit lower, the spoofing methods will not achieve the same um, spoofing method, meaning polynomial classical algorithms, right? Uh, will not achieve um, the same cross entropy or fidelity that what we report in the experiment. And I think what difference for this oh. paper, for instance, is um, we're, we're taking the limit of D to infinity, right? We just need to keep the error per, per layer constant. Uh, but in principle, you can go to very large steps and you know everything still works as long as their probability is constant, even at very large steps. Of course, there are reasons why you cannot go to very large steps experimentally is because the you know fidelity is decreasing. So the number of samples that you will need to take would increase exponentially with depth anyway. Yeah. But it's not a question about the spoofing anymore. It's a question about the experiment just requiring too many samples. So wait, does um does this algorithm that uh that Sun Wan worked on um a few years ago where you kind of just like you delete a few of the gates and you simulate each half and then you you know produce an output and then it doesn't do anything close to simulating the actual circuit but it turns out to have um you know a decent score on the cross-entry benchmarking so you're saying that this algorithm would not be competitive with uh the quantum output when the noise is so low is that yeah for that for that algorithm, we can actually make a precise statement. Yes. So there, for, for it, there is a there is an analogous phase transition. This is slightly different. It's only a different wave factor from the noise-induced phase transition. After which, the the spoofing XZB linear XZB that you can achieve is exponentially smaller than the one you're measuring. In the okay, and this is related to this this StatMech stuff that you were saying at the end, or. Um, yes, I actually I have a slide I can <laughs> to make it even more provocative. I can show it uh, okay. if we if that's uh, okay uh, on this. Yeah. So, but but just to make sure I'm I'm on the same page. So on the leading order, what you mean by spoofing is a specific class of task where you first represent a wave function that has a high enough fidelity using tensor network, and then doing the task of sampling by contracting them is maybe not possible in the regime when you know error layer, error per layer is small but it's not about spoofing open to entire set of algorithms like not even our own but it's like a spoofing is not possible for a certain specific set of attacks is that it's a good understanding and then constia is going to talk about as a separate slide uh, about like something relevant to our previous work is that is that is that good understanding so far no, sorry. So in the talk, we are very careful to compare against tensor networks because those are the algorithms that are, you know, actually competitive, meaning like they actually reproduce, you know, <laughs> the sampling from 2019. So they're the ones that are actually ahead, right? And also, um, I think the MPS algorithms kind of covers in a way like uh, maybe algorithms that you can work on, right? Because you you work on like, you know, what happens if you just have two halves? This algorithm say like, well, simulate two halves, but actually, you know. It's half of one dimension in the middle, and and anyway, and then we care about you know bounding how much memory you need, even without caring about the computational cost. So we do that. But when we're talking about the spoofing now, we talk about those are you know still all exponential algorithms, and it's a question of they're exponential, you know, but but um, but if you work on them, even if the cost is exponential, you can reduce the cost by non-trivial, you know, you do it on the spot end until you actually beat the experiment, right? 
Uh, but what we mean by spoofing is polynomial algorithms, right? Like the, the one from Loomis. But, but Sergio, any, any polynomial algorithm though, not just well, specific ones that we've seen, or maybe that's the point, I think. I, uh, get not, one you I, I guess not any, we cannot say generally like any algorithm, but algorithms maybe Costi will explain on this slide that look like, you know, you have like some representation of your wave function and then you kind of, you know, you apply right. your gate and then you do something to simplify your wave function that looks like noise. Sure. And that's kind of, you get the relation, which doesn't cover necessarily all uh, polynomial algorithms, right. as you know, but but I think it covers, you know, at, at least the ones from Zoom 1, and it might cover more, you know, like you, you can yeah. model them, you know, but maybe you know it's just, I mean, Zoom 1, you, you said that displays in your paper, the noise just kills completely, like these links, you concentrate on the noise somewhere. So the, it covers like algorithms in that family. Well, I'm not I'm not hundred percent convinced yet about that. Our right, right, yeah. that, that's that's why yeah. it would we'll be good to discuss yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shall I do that? Uh, sure. Yeah. If you is is that uh, do a few minutes? Uh, yeah. Let me go here. Yeah. So uh, again, do you see my slides? Yes. Yes. So so this is. Uh, Spoofing, as Sergio said, we think of it as a polynomial, as an algorithm that doesn't try to solve the actual computational task. Instead, it tries to produce an output that, in, by some measure, is as good as the output of the noisy hardware. And in this case, we will talk about linear XZB because that's what we're talking about. I mean, yeah, that will be the criteria for this case. And the simplest example was in the in the paper by someone and others. Uh, where you can just uh, split the circuit, delete the gates from the circuit in such a way that you simulate two half of, of the system. And the remarkable observation is that this, in this case, if you calculate XZB between this uh, wave function and the ideal wave function is actually larger than zero, at least up to some depth. Um, but uh, kind of what we learn from studying noise and use space transition is that spoofing, there is a boundary between where uh, uh, this uh, XZB from this type of spoofing where we slice the circuit. Uh, or in, in other ways, we add errors, but in a controlled way. Uh, in this case, we expect that there is a, a transition uh, as well in the spoofing at some point which differs by a factor A from the noise and use phase transition. And the way kind of to get intuition why this happens is we can go back to this weakling model, which is the kind of the, that allows analytical solution. A, a linear XZB for it was consisting of this contribution of actual fidelity, right, of the whole system. And then the uh, contribution that was uh, proportional to fidelity of the half the system, right, either A or B, well, both actually, and and this uh, factor that uh, determines the rate of convergence to uh, to quantum chaos in some sense to an ergodic state. And uh, the idea what you what you can do in spoofing is uh, you can place this uh, you, you use the simulation which is not noisy, right? But you don't want to simulate the whole system, right? So the the only assumption we need to make here is that you cannot simulate the actual Porter Thomas distribution, right? Just because you're spoofing, right? That will take exponential time. You're, you're doing a smaller simulation. In that sense, you're exploiting, exploiting the terms that are actually vanishing at d equals to infinity. So these are these terms, exactly. And uh, we can put an upper bound on these terms by just putting fidelity to one here. So we'll just take this. And the spoofing is successful is what when we obtain uh, this in this without a full simulation, we obtain an XZB that is larger than the fidelity uh, of the actual experiment, right? And we can again upper bound this XZB, and and this condition that fidelity is uh, smaller than this, is actually means that a equals to one half. So for this model, we see that there is a boundary actually. Uh, so, so I'm confused. Uh, in this formula, if I just read it as it is, we have XEB similar one plus two lambda. So do you obtain the XEB that's larger than one? And are we done already? Like I'm, I'm a bit confused. Uh, well, now this... right. 
FD FD plus two lambda d over t, right, Kostya? Uh, which one are you talking about? Uh, the one plus two lambda d to the previous line. A little bit further up. This one. This <laughs> well, in XCB, initially you write FD plus two lambda FD square root of FD, but then you just you know. Right, you just keep the one there. This, this. Oh yeah. So this is a kind of a this is noise free XZB. This is kind of a, in principle what we do. You would kind of maximum XZB you can have, right? But what's important is in the spoofing, because you are not simulating, uh, you are not using exponential exponential algorithm. You are can only take advantage of the terms that are transient. That that is not a steady state of the random circuit. You're right, but let me argue. Okay, so I think we move the one there, or you're looking at XCV plus one when you write that equation. Yeah, I, this, I, I, the extra one is the thing that is confusing. No, no, XCV at infinite time converges to one, right? Well, not if you're spoofing, right? That's, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that, yeah, yeah. So this this like wiggly uh, bracket means that spoofing can only reproduce this part; it cannot reproduce yeah. the one. Yeah, I agree, but I have a comment. So here you assume that you are right. We are exploiting the components coming from f to the power d over two. And therefore you replace it with the maximum value one. But actually the maximum value is not one. It's actually exponentially large. The reason, it could be exponentially large, but it usually doesn't have to be. The reason being, we have an exact description of the wave function of the half the system. Therefore, we can do the adversarial sampling to just sample the same B strings that has a probability that's larger than the, you know, the inverse dimension of the subsystem. Therefore, by replacing it to one, we are assuming that we just do the kind of perfect sampling. But in fact, we can do amplified adversarial sampling to make this contribution even larger than one. That, that's, I think, what's missing in this analysis. Um, honestly, yeah. But feeling is that our algorithm, we, we did our best using one GPU um, desktop computer. And that computation didn't actually outperform you know, this circuit uh, for the same fidelity of a larger system. I, we did outperform the, the 70 qubit actually system if you had not improved the fidelity. But now that this chipset has improved fidelity, we are not 100% sure we can outperform you know, this chipset. But this argument, in my view, does not actually, you know, like uh, prove that our algorithm would not work. Well, so there is there is an additional factor you can win by resampling, indeed. But that also you need to resample for a very long time, right? There is an additional cost. Yeah. Also, I have to remind you that there's a question on the chat, so maybe we uh, Yeah, yeah, we we should we should get there. But so before we get there, uh, Bill, were you trying to? Did you have some comment about complexity, or should we move on? No, I have plenty of comments about complexity. Yeah, but you, but maybe please, please go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to maybe change the topic just a little bit. Um, I was very interested in what you were talking about when you were saying talking about the white noise regime. Um, and I'm actually interested in that because, um, you know, someone else on this panel, Alex uh, in particular, you know, has papers where he, he sort of uh, looks at somewhat related scenarios where he says, you know, if the noise is sufficiently small, if it's like one over n or some one over n log n or something like this, you know, you, you have white noise regime, which means that the noise again is sort of uncorrelated with the uh, the signal in a certain sense. And then, you know, we can actually sometimes get complexity theoretic arguments that are mm -hmm. really formal back. Um, but then, you know, so let, let's just assume that that's what we're trying to, to reach, this sort of white noise regime. I think a lot of the uh, XEB theory you were talking about sort of assumes that in some sense. But I, I wanted to ask, you, you sort of had this comment where you said that's not actually what you see in the experiment, right? Um, mm -hmm. And and I sort of assume it's because there are some there's some biased noise maybe at, at certainly at readout and things like that. But I sort of want to just just see how close are we? Do you think to 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 seeing something that would be like uh, like white noise? And and is, is that just a bad model, or is it that it's sort of a good model but it doesn't characterize all of the um, the noise? And then what you know how what what exactly is going on with this this white noise or this global you know depolarizing in in your opinion? Well, I mean, um, um, I guess the 
Uh, well, first, of course, we have readout bias, so that's that's for sure. You can see that yeah. you know very easily. Um, yeah, yeah, if you just see, that's fine. Order by how I many distance? And that's probably, probably that. non-unital, right? Um, yeah. No, that's not unital, yeah. Right, right. But the case, the state one, you yeah, know, exactly. state uh, with exactly. high probability, yeah. But there's probably something in between the the gates too, right? It's not just about the readout, or 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 no. Um, I mean. It's very hard to characterize. I mean, we have like, you know, multiple models of, of what noise we have. Yeah. For, for instance, we have some leakage, right, at some point. And, you know, leakage um, is not Markovian, right? Like, we, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a smaller yeah. than, than other sources of noise. In the case of quantum error correction, we care a lot about leakage because it's a very uh, dangerous type of noise. Uh, so we actually measure it and band it and things like that. But leakage is not even Markovian. Once you populate, you know, a higher state, which is not even a qubit, it just takes a bit to relax. You have to do several tricks to, you know, to actually relax it, right? Things like that. So um, there, there are also all just kinds of things. There are also high energy event like cosmic rays, things like that. So. Oh, no, 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 oh, yeah, that I, yeah. I, I, I understand. No, but I guess Sorry. I'm asking, like, is there is there a sort of, uh, you know, how much are we simplifying in, in some non-quantitative sense when we talk when we talk about this um, white noise picture? Is it something that you think is essentially right, but there's a little bit of sort of epsilon other stuff going on? Or is it maybe there's a really quantitative difference between the, hard, the, the hardness that we see for the noise uh, and the white noise model? I guess it depends what you're looking at. You know, if we use sort of bond, uh, group beta streams, like if you do histograms and things like that, then you kind of whiten it a little, you know? And we often do histograms, like when we do the comparison with a Colmore office mirror model, things like that, then you whiten it a little bit because you're just doing some groupings of probabilities, then it works really well. If you don't group probabilities at all, then, you know, you, you can see a difference. And actually, um, we also did some particular experiment where, you, where we inject like a particular um, discrete error somewhere, and then you know you really have to take into account that it's, it's really not fully depolarizing at all because, I mean, it depends with with how much precision you look at the noise, I guess. Wait, Sergio, so is you the reason you think that it's not the white noise model is it's just because you're seeing non-uniform outputs like bias towards zero or one? Or can you say again? Maybe I missed. Um, um, we see. Non-uniform outputs by S towards zero or one for sure. Mm -hmm. And back in 2019, um, you know, we were studying if when we introduce like one exactly one error, like by some coherent angle, you know, will we'll like one error sort of gives you the fidelity that we expect, which is a very specific kind of noise, just like one coherent error in the middle of the circuit. And it, we couldn't interpret the data for a while. And it was because, you know, we had to remember that <clears throat> we really had to, to think of the model as, you know, like errors per gate and not, not really like a globally depolarizing model. So that was one particular experiment, right? Which, you know, we did the experiment and we couldn't understand the data until we realized we were using the globally depolarizing model and it just didn't work. I see. Because it's like, you, you could be close like it would be hard to verify that you're far from this white noise distribution. Like you'd have to, you know, repeat the experiment an exponential number of times to like see that it's not exactly the number it should be. Like, I mean, it's easy to see when there's some bias at the end that gives you more zeros than ones, but if there's some something wrong in the middle or it's just not, you know, we in our paper, we only analyzed unital har random noise, uh, which is very narrow. So, you know, if there's some, deviation from that that's causing something. I, I don't know how one would experimentally detect it. Well, not with many qubits, I guess. Um, yeah, I, but you know, yeah. with you know, with a smaller number of qubits, you can, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I guess I guess one uh, one effect maybe that that could uh, build maybe that could like lead to a deviation from the white noise assumption um, at like shallower depths even so even if you're beneath this threshold where you can like uh you yeah. know this epsilon you know some constant over n threshold where you're kind of expecting yeah, yeah. it to all work out um there's still this yeah this competition between you know kind of like what Sunil was saying like there's this uh this benchmark uh, xcb quantity that starts at like two to the n and actually it like goes all the yeah, way down sure. to a constant in like log time 
um, and then it starts decaying. And then, and meanwhile, the fidelity starts at one and it decays. And the right. idea is like, if the fidelity is decaying slower, then eventually this thing that started to the end will become smaller than the thing that started at one. Um, but actually, like, I think if, if you're kind of just below the transition, but you're not that far below the transition, the point where these cross might be like actually very far. And, and some of the numerics we did in this paper that you mentioned, like suggested that actually you need a lot more gates than what they can do, um, like than, than what are being done in the, in the experiments now to kind of have this crossover actually have happened. Um, although we can't really simulate the exact experiment because it's like 2D. So, so how did the number of gates stuff. scale? Is it like n log n or something better or something else? Yeah. It would still be, uh, it would still be like, uh, yeah. And well, the number of layers would be log n. So there'd be like n log yeah, n gates. Yeah. But the right, constant right. in front of the n log n would get bigger as you get closer to the transition point, I think. I see. I see. Um, Got it. And as you go all the way to the transition point, it would become like infinite, uh, this transition. They would never cross, right? Um, yeah. So, but I don't know how you would detect that in the experiment. So, uh, I'm not sure. I guess you could do it at a small system size where you can calculate. Well, even yeah. then, you have to, yeah, you have to repeat a lot of times to characterize your whole distribution. That's a very interesting uh, discussion. Yeah. So, um, so I, I guess uh, Sergio, can you can you say in a in a simple way what you know what you actually see experimentally, or do you, do you have a do you have a notion of what these that that the noise maybe gives you you, you think it's it's not white noise, but it's independent or some some other some other way of thinking about. It? Um, um, yeah, I guess the best um, model I have is the one I try to put on the on the third slide, which is you know, as long as the noise is independent of the ideal probabilities mm -hmm. uh, and does not concentrate the output probability too much, then cross entropy works. Yeah, and then you know because it's still not um, concentrating you anywhere, uh, mm -hmm. then you can just group probabilities and things like that, you're gonna get, um, you know, Kolmorov, Smirnov and things like that are gonna work just fine. Other mm -hmm. tests like, um, we also look at tests like collision probabilities will work just fine. So that's sort of the the best model I have. We, um, you know, the, the two instances we personally look at were the, the readout bias and also this other case in the paper where we purposely introduce like some extra phase and, and try to see that it was decreasing the fidelity uh, as expected. And we just couldn't get it to work out until we remember, you know, that that the totally depolarizing channel was just a, a model, right? We, we have to actually take into account that this, uh, you know, sequence of gates and, and how the noise was spreading and things like that. Right. But maybe that's a special case because we were introducing noise by hand. It, um, so um, maybe should we uh, should we see if um, Manuel um, you had a question? Do you want to go ahead and ask? Uh, I think it's in the it's in the chat. But uh, Manuel, do you want to go ahead and ask that uh, by unmuting? Uh, maybe um, uh, since it has to do with your paper, Sinwon, do you want to yeah. you want to ask a question? So they were asking uh, what happens with a quantity such as FC introduced in you know Manuel and my you know collaborations. Uh, the idea is you know with the very short time depth when the XCB is very large, where fidelity is of course upper bounded by one. In fact, you can use empirical formula uh, by just dividing FXCB by the, you know, the, the ideal value of XAB. And turns out, empirically, we see that, you know, this already captures the reality very well in the same regime. Mm -hmm. the error rate per layer is not so good. So in some sense, that also brings the connection to the, you know, question about phase transition. Like in what sense it's a phase transition? It could be that we just modify the, you know, formula for the XAB by proper normalization. Then we can now construct the you know, object 
that seems to follow the fidelity. So it's just that the estimator is not good in this regime uh, because of nonlinear behavior. So do you have any comments about that? Kostya, you wanna answer that? I don't quite understand how you construct this. So you just divide by the ideal? Yeah, yeah. So the XCB is basically correlating probability from the experiment and probability of the ideal case. So you could consider say F ideal where this is just both perfect probabilities. And because at short time, it's not yet anti-concentrated, this value will be very large at the short time. What we do is we divide this XEB by this new quantity F ideal. And this turns out this quantity has an interpretation as a, you know, uh, in terms of spin language, it's, it's related to the average expectation value of the magnetization in the, in the small perturbation of the noise. Therefore, it still estimates the amount of the fidelity reduction very well. Would, in yeah. practice, would there be large fluctuations uh, in your estimate? Because you know, it's you're a right. Large. You're right. So you need to sample a lot, but it turns out this decays pretty rapidly. So in the region where it's right, reasonable, so at t equal one after one layer, maybe it's not reasonable to do this. But layer two or three, it already converges very quickly, and Manuel is now like on his computer, so maybe he can. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, I wasn't on my computer already because we had a group meeting now. Yeah, I agree with Sumo, and I think it also relates to the question of global white noise, because this new estimator, you can basically show it works also if you don't have global white noise. So um, in particular, you just need an error to spread locally. So I, I wonder, like, why not use that one? It's clearly the better estimator, and basically, <laughs> the fidelity converges to, to FXCP for deep circuits and works for shallower circuits. So it should be the preferred quantity generally for random circuits, in our opinion. Why not use that one? For this one, do you still have to face transition? These are the two questions. It seems like the useful regime for this quantity is before what we call anti-concentration, right? For a noisy circuit. So right? That's code, where yes, once it's anti-concentrated, this numerator at the denominator converges to one by definition. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it works for all regimes, like automatically takes care of the short time, the late time, like together. So it, it works equally at the late time. Yeah, yeah, but the phase transition, the way it's defined, right? Like XZB converging to fidelity only happens beyond anti concentration. You need to take sufficient depth. So it's in this sense, I say yes, it will show the same the same behavior. I see. So, so, yeah, about phase transition, but, so we read the paper, and the, the dynamical phase transition is another phase transition we talk about. Yeah. And we are talking about that phase transition. Hmm. Happens earlier. Yes. What is the question then? Can... Because here there's no, you know, no crossing because uh, this modified formula, it's always upper bound from one. And it seems to agree with the fidelity in all regimes as long as error per layer is sufficiently small. So, so to be clear, I mean, you're not talking about a different phase transition, not the one we cover in the talk. But in the paper, we talk about paper, a different transition, which is uh, related to anti-concentration. Yes. What you're saying, if you normalize, you know, the cross entropy as as you explain by just dividing by the cross entropy at large depths, then you wouldn't see the phase transition, which is related to anti-concentration, because you're normalizing it away. Exactly. Uh, you will still see the phase transition that we talk about today. Um, you know, we didn't want to cover the other one because it's just more stuff. And I think that's the answer. Like, yeah, I, th I think I agree. Will it smooth out, you know, the first transition? And but it will still the transition that we were talking about today within the wind and strong noise regime because the first transition is about anti concentration that that one will be smoothed out. The second transition, which is about weak to strong noise, I think that one will still be there even with that estimator. And to the question why we don't use it, I mean, I think if you're working at low depth, that's a great, you know, thing to do. And, and we don't always use cross entropy as presented here. Um, for like two qubits, we don't use that equation. We use cross entropy, but we do something else. Um, but the reason why we use these equations as well is because, well, first we, we want to be beyond anti-concentration point because we also care about the computational benchmark part. And, and then, you know, we want to have large enough depth so that we have some confidence that things are, you know, quite entangled. 
And using these other formulas allow us to compare linear to logarithmic cross entropy, for instance, and make sure that they give the same estimate. So, uh, you know, that's one way to sort of check that that we have enough depth and, and things are working properly. Like, but, but yeah, I mean, and also for to use that equation, I guess you have to calculate, you know, what happens with the ideal probabilities. And I'll have to think about that if you can use the same ones that you're sampling in the experiment, but you probably have to use another one, so at least sample uniformly beta streams, right? To estimate the quantity in the denominator. And that's just more computational cost, I guess. Um, but I mean, for low depth, I mean, there, I'm sure there are circumstances, you know, when this other estimator is pretty useful. I have nothing uh, against it. I, I have to, I really have to switch to, to another meeting. Yeah, actually, I, I was going to say, um, uh, yeah, we are probably out of time now, but uh, thank you again, Costa uh, uh, and uh, Sergio, for that. That was a really nice, nice uh, talk, really nice work that you spoke about. and. Uh, Thank Thanks, you. Alex and Bill and Sunwan for a lively panel. Uh, so, and with that, this is um, this is the last colloquium of the of the series. So, um, thanks everyone for joining, and um, look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.